Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 14th episode of Conceptualism. I'm very pleased to have with me here today uh, Cedric Fermont, who is a interdisciplinary conceptual artist uh, working with sound. He is a composer, a singer, a drummer, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's remarkable the breadth and depth of your work, and also an archivist and a collector of, of experimental music from all over the world. Um, so thank you so much for being with us here today, uh, Cedric, and uh, I look forward to this conversation. Yeah, thank you too. Hello. <laughs> so I guess I want to start out by asking you, um, you know, how you got into making sound, what fascinated you about sound, you know, um, and, and, and what was your journey into, uh, you know, into this, uh, uh, into this uh, field? Mm, I always enjoyed sound since I'm a kid. I cannot exactly know when uh, I, I realized that it sounds itself that attracts me rather than melodies that I may like as well or, or percussions and so on. Um, but I always enjoyed music and, and sounds in, in general. I, I know I was making little noises when I was a kid for the sake of hearing those noises but not thinking about the musicality of it mm. uh, and then uh, I studied orchestral drums when I was 13 uh, that was in the 1980s and um, four years later I started my first band that was an industrial and noise music duo um, I was uh, I was 14 when I uh, is it 14? Yeah, yeah, 14 when I discovered, uh, I think so, <laughs> I'm forgetting, um, slowly electronic music and then uh, industrial music and so on. Yeah, I was 14 back then, I remember. Um, and so I dived into it and discovered more and more. At the beginning, I, I listened to well-known artists, not really experimental, like uh, Skinny Puppy, or Leibach and uh, Front 242, a bands from Europe and North America mostly, but of course you get, you find connections. Oh, then you end up listening to uh, Anstutzen and Neibauten, and then to Esplendor Geometrico, and then to uh, uh, John Cage, and then to um, Stockhausen and Xenakis and so on. And uh, right. yeah, this is how everything started. Right, and, and I mean, you know, like like you say, like all these all these things are so interconnected. You discover one, and then because you discovered that one artist, suddenly you you you're you're branching out into the whole network of that that kind of music or those kinds of you know uh, those kinds of uh, you know those kinds of sound uh, uh, profiles. I guess you could say, like for example, if you're listening to Miarzabal, uh, you know, then suddenly like you start listening to a whole bunch of music that's kind of like that. And so, you know, and then you start to make these connections, you know, almost like a, like a, like a mind map or like, you know, like a, like a tree, like there's all these different branches that, that, you know, that sort of make their way from that, you know, that initial uh, seed that, that you discover. Yeah, that, that's right. Of course, uh, for people who are curious, you, Every artist leads you to 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 other artists or other genres, scenes, and of course you mentioned Mertz Bau. Uh, when I heard that for the first time, I was really impressed, and I wanted to discover more. And there was this this tape scene, and of course then it led me to the so-called Japanese, and then to um, a fantastic compilation I remember back then called the American Japanese Noise Treaty or the Japanese American Noise Treaty, I don't remember which way, but it also led me to more academic works of uh, Pauline Oliveros, for example, mm. worked with noise as well in, in the 1950s, already 50s, 60s. Mm. Um, yeah, sure, of course, everything is interconnected. And, you know, actually speaking of this Japanese noise scene, there, there, I saw this really interesting experiment where, uh, um, I'm forgetting the name of the artist, but he basically put symbols onto the turntables and he was using the needle to, to basically scratch out the sound on the symbols. So instead of records, he had symbols on the turntables. Um, 
Yeah, it's most likely o Otomo Yoshihide, I That's guess you are mentioning yes. now. Yes, 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 yeah. That's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that's the name of the artist. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's the name of the artist. And, you know, when I saw that, I was like, this is so cool. Like, I I was so impressed by that, you know. Um, and, and, and you know, it, it got me interested in, you know, in, you know, in all the different things that you could do with a turntable. And, you know, I started, uh, you know, I started using different objects. Like, uh, you know, I, I tried, um, like, for example, I tried what a cork, you know, what cork is, right? The, the material. And I, I put like a cork disc on the, on the turntable. And then I had the needle scratching into the cork. And that produced an interesting sound. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable, like how these ideas will, will, will like spark, you know, this, this creativity, like you'll see something really interesting and, and you'll be like, well, this is really cool. Now, what can I do with it? Or, or how can I take this further? Or what, can, you know, it, it has all these offshoots, which I think is really interesting. Oh, no, definitely. Experimentation is, uh, is always interesting. <laughs> uh, what I find a bit disappointing nowadays, I would say, is that um, many artists, uh, labels, people, even journalists, call experimental everything that is maybe a tiny bit out of the norm uh, of a, or, or a certain kind of norm. And I, I, I dislike this. I mean, in the word experimental, there is experiment. If you don't experiment, it's not experimental, <laughs> for for sure. And I think it's getting harder and harder. I I often tell people, okay, I do experimental music to make it simple. Because if I start to say, yeah, I'm doing electroacoustic music, acousmatic music, harsh noise, uh, or wh whatever, many people don't know what it is. Right. Like so if I say experimental, they, they they get a if you're trying to get technical, yeah. like if you tell if you tell somebody, you know, I I made an electroacoustic composition with contact microphones. Like most most people don't even know what a contact microphone is, you know. So it's like you're you're suddenly like you're you're in a you're, you're in a very small niche where it's you know it's either academics or or fellow experimental artists who or who who will sort of be like, oh, that's so cool. Everybody else will just be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> No, that's true. So to make it simple, I, I often define parts of my music with this word experimental, even though I, I don't believe I do a lot of experimental music in the end, because often when I finish a piece, I think, or when I analyze the process, I think, yeah, but somebody did it before me anyway. It's not that original. And the, the result might be, uh, might please my ears, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> But that doesn't make it uh, super avant-garde experimental. That, that's I, I think it's it's very difficult nowadays to to do something extremely uh, new and original because so much has been done already. Uh, You're absolutely yeah, right. It's, then, it's my view. But the, but you see the thing is, Cedric, uh, we don't live in an ahistoric vacuum. I mean, we have to contend with all the things that have come before. So, you know, whether or not it's original or not, I mean, I don't think anything can truly be original, you know, because everything is based off of something, you know. So, so I think mm -hmm, this, myth, mm -hmm. this myth of originality that we've been sold, you know, I think by the capitalist system, you know, oh, if you have an original idea, you know, then suddenly, you know, it's something you'll capitalize on. But everything comes from somewhere. You can trace the lineage. You can trace, you can trace where the idea comes from. You know, so even the people that claim to be original, I find most of the time when somebody says, oh, I'm original, I'm very suspicious of that. I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't take that too seriously, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. It's, uh, the, when we, we speak about it again, it's just interconnection. It's uh, uh, rhizomatic, basically, like Deleuze would say, uh, you have plenty of connections and you, it's not, or oh, it's rarely or, or, or it's never, I can't really tell, a, a, a pyramid with, okay, there is this genius on top of the pyramid that invented this and that, and the rest comes from this genius. No, everybody gets influences from from various sources and not only music, it's just uh, life in, in, in general, what we experience. So um, we always grab from here and there. That's a clear fact. Yeah. And well, um, it's interesting because the, the myth of genius, you know, um, there's a there's a there's a guy called Brian Eno, 
who invented or not invented, but coined a term called uh, seniors, which I think is really a beautiful concept. You know, the idea that that really like artists that are quote unquote geniuses, they come from a scene. They come from a certain place, a certain time, a certain set of other artists, collectors, uh, you know, patrons, institutions like that. No artist, uh, you know, is is quote unquote, you know, like you said, at the very top of the pyramid, looking down and suddenly, you know, like Kandinsky, you know, is not the, you know, he, he's not the be all end all in, when it comes to like abstract art or, you know, with this particular genre, because there, if you look at that period in Russia, there were thousands and thousands of other painters who were doing exactly the same thing, but we just don't know about them. You know, so it's not like he, it's not like Kandinsky invented this, you know, I mean, he just happens to be the best known person in that particular you know, field. And it's the same thing with art and, and the same thing with music and the same thing with life. You know, the people that we happen to look up to are the people that we think, oh, you know, they're, they're sort of defining this movement or defining this, you know, this scene. Well, you know, they, they're, they're drawing from something. They, they don't come from nowhere. No, sure, of course. And there, there are many parallels to, to, to be made. Sometimes something um, pops up in a way. I would not I'm not sure I should use that word because nothing comes out of the blue, of course. <laughs> but you can see it with uh, the the uh, punk music, for example. The, officially, it was born in 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 London in the 1970s, mid 70s, blah blah. But there was a kind of similar scene in New York at the same time. You can see the same with Dada. It was officially born in Zurich in in Switzerland, but there were similar experiments also. Uh, in the USA and a bit later in uh, Georgia, I mean, back then in, U in USSR with the movement called, um, I think it was 42 degrees or 40 degrees. Ah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> um, and uh, with mu music as well, and all this also depends not only on the culture, but on the technology that is accessible. Mm. So if we all use the same tools, uh, the same pigments, the same softwares or instruments, we might end up doing something a bit similar. Definitely. Maybe not, but chances are that we, we will do it. Uh, that's to me very obvious, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about uh, sound systems and particularly, you know, um, you know uh, like something like uh, 3D sound, you know, like um, have you worked, have you worked with, um, you know, with that, like, I think it's called Dolby Atmos, where, you know, where you have the sound coming out from like all around you and, uh, um, you know, um, have you ever worked in that kind of quote unquote 3D space with your compositions? I worked, but in uh, some acousmonium. So, um, okay. an acousmonium is, is not exactly, the, the, I mean, the Dolby systems are very particular mm. you need to respect where to put to put the speakers and so on as far as i know with the acousmonium you, you put the speakers wherever you want mm -hmm. and you create this kind of so-called 3d sound so you can put speakers uh, layers of uh, layers of speakers uh, in front of the audience mm -hmm. but at different distances uh, on the sides uh, among the audience behind Mm. on the ceiling everywhere mm. uh, i've got sometimes the opportunity to play in uh, with acousmoniums uh, once in uh, in vienna at the, the acousmatic festival uh, there were as far as i remember about 52 speakers so i did not use all of them it's pretty stressful and uh, i'm not so used to it so i used about 30 of them which is already uh, <laughs> super oh, nice, nice. And uh, I did some uh, quadraphonic concerts now and then. I, this is some, something I, I do on um, m at least several times per year. It's not an acousmonium in that case, but already four speakers in a square to me is already amazing mm. uh, to give some depth and uh, um, a more cinematic uh, impression to your music. Yeah. And I played uh, somewhere else on an acousmonium, but I can't remember where and with how many speakers <laughs> i mean I, I did it two three times in my life to play in, with so many speakers i wish i could do it more often but i rarely applied because you need time to prepare either to select pieces or to prepare a composition especially dedicated to the system 
um, and I'm, I don't always have, or don't always take time, better say like this. But to me, it's, um, it could be one of the futures of music, even though this, uh, this future is old. <laughs> Basically, it's a kind of a retro future. The Acousmonium exists uh, for a few decades. It, it, uh, the first ones, I don't remember from when they, uh, I think they emerged in, in, maybe in France, I can't remember, but it, it's already from the 50s or 60s as far as I remember. And in the 70s, you, you had these uh, quadraphonic uh, records also that were published. Um, so it's nothing new, but uh, right now, unfortunately, I think we are going a lot uh, backward uh, regarding technology. Like more and more people listen on, uh, on one speaker, these uh, a powerful, full of bass uh, cylinders, the speakers, I don't know how you call them. Yeah, and uh, this like is how Alexa, people... Li like Alexa and Google Nest and yeah. all this stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, that's sad. I'm composing stereo music. I mean, really, I work a lot on the stereo sometimes. And it ends up that people listen to this with, with only one speaker or with with the phone, with the smartphone, and I, I think it's a bit, or MP3s. Um, and I think less and less people are willing to invest in a good sound system, less and less people buy um, physical music. Yeah. And people live maybe also in, in smaller and smaller places with neighbors and people have focus on a focus, they, they, they focus on, other things as well. Some people are less interested in music nowadays. They maybe turn on a playlist, and they don't know they don't know who who is being played, and they don't care. But they have other centers of interest. It can be video games, can be going on holiday, whatever. So I think many people care less than it used to be regarding having a good sound at home or attending a concert, like. A, a multiphonic concert. <laughs> it's right. And, and yeah, I mean, it's like like you say, like people's priorities have changed. Like even the idea of a concert now, you know, when people think about a concert, they're thinking, you know, they're thinking about, you know, either a pop or a rock or you know, or or even like a lot of people are used to, I don't know, like like mainstream techno or like or deep house or whatever. Or like when they go into the club, they have the top forties playlist, you know. So they, in that in that sense, it's kind of like their, their ability to have a more diverse and more informed taste of music has become less and less because, you know, there's less and less diversity in all the places that they're looking, whether, whether it's, you know, on the radio, whether it's, you know, in, you know, in, in, in the club or, you know, or even on the internet, there's, there's, the, you know, the, the, the artists that they're listening to, you know, it's like, it's the music, it's the music in the background, they, they're not really paying attention to it at all. It's, it's like, yeah, which is which is very like you say it, it's like people's even people's attention spans have changed. Like people don't they if you if you give someone an hour and a half long composition to listen to, I mean how many people are gonna sit through that? Most people don't have the patience to sit for five minutes and listen to a you know listen to a piece of music. So so you know you're right. I mean the the whole landscape has changed dramatically, and and it's very unfortunate. But. Yeah, that is partly true. I would say that people, nevertheless, if I compare it to my youth in the 1970s, 80s, uh, I think people have a bigger access to, to music now. Mm. Of course, then it's a choice to want to be curious about it or not, but it, ha it has never been so easy to access everything now, Agreed. thanks to the internet, at least for it's those more, who can access it's the more, internet. It's more accessible um, And also, people, pardon? It's more accessible than ever. You're right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's and also more. Go ahead. And more and more people travel as well, uh, artists or not artists. So they're also exposed to other cultures and other forms of music. So I think it became easier. So uh, I think it's a lot by choice when people just decide to turn on uh, the mainstream radio or to go to the um, uh, boring house and techno club and so on. Uh, even though not all techno is boring, <laughs> but, um, to choose the mainstream path, but you see it with everything, uh, with the cinema, it's the same. If you 
see what are the the, the biggest films, the the most famous films. It, to me, most of the time, it's just to my taste, it's crap. Nothing else. Um, there are so many more interesting films and short films, and we can also access a lot on on the internet. I mean, not only through pirate website illegally as well. You have Vimeo or um, or YouTube or else where you you can watch for free many short films, many experimental films. Definitely. But many people don't put any effort in it. And that's that's a clear fact. The society has changed a lot. But I think nevertheless that people on an average, most people have always been into um easy art, easy hmm. listening, Definitely. whatever. And uh, not not something challenging too much. Even though there were periods where the, the curiosity was maybe um more there than other periods also and it also depends on people's priorities and and uh, the social economic context also which is right now not really good for example yes. in almost everywhere <laughs> right now in fact <laughs> yeah so mm -hmm. um can you tell me about uh, the label that you founded surf and and what's or you know what what's the yeah what what your what your uh, motivation is what your what your agenda is with the label i started it uh, in in the early 2000 i think 2002 if i'm not wrong to publish my own music my first solo album i published a few cd's with uh, some of my um, bands uh, before that in the late 90s early 2000s like axiom and uh, ombre and um, some other ones, and um, I wanted to control a bit more some of my releases and, and give a try to see how it works, because I had a tape label in the 1990s, where I published also some solo stuff, uh, so uh, so to speak, it was my, to publish my first solo CD by label, but I had released a few tapes back then, but the tape scene, um, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s was not like what it is now. Um, it was more uh, putting out a, a demo, or uh, not for everybody, of course. There were very specific niches for experimental music, for punk, metal, noise. Uh, but it was not a trend like it is now. Now it's really a trend to publish a, a tape. Nevertheless, um, a few years after 2002, I decided, to, well, in 2005, I decided to, uh, 2007, sorry, <laughs> um, to publish um, international compilation that included artists from Asia and Africa. Mm. And this is when I decided that um, I should publish more artists from Asia and Africa in the field of uh, electronic music in general and electroacoustic noise, experimental music, free improv, because I toured um, back then, um, 2003, I went to Turkey, 2004, Thailand and Laos. And then from 2000, 2005, I made a big tour, six month tour across um, Vietnam, China, Singapore, um, Laos, um, South Korea and so on to uh, try to understand what's going on there to perform as well, to meet artists and to bring back music also, because in the end we had little contact with those places. Everybody could tell you, yeah, I know these bands from Japan, Hana Tarash, Mertz Bao, uh, Hicho Kaidan, and so on and so forth. But they could not, most people could not give you one single name of a band or an artist from China, from Singapore, uh, from Turkey, from Morocco, from South Africa, even though we had a bit of contacts. I had contacts in, with South Africa since the 1990s, in fact. So I wanted to to show, hey, there are many people active there as well, and, and they do interesting music. Um, and uh, from that moment, I mostly dedicated the, the label to music from Africa, Asia, a tiny bit Latin America uh, in a more recent time, and my own uh, projects. Uh, so uh, solo or, or duo, 
tree or whatever and you also it is. you also have like a large a large list of artists from 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 uh like as part of like surf's website i think you have like a a large uh like ar like archive or library of names of artists uh from from all of the world who are doing experimental music i do yeah i focus also on to a music from Asia and Africa and Latin America I have no time because it's it's so big there it has been documented anyway already you can find some web websites yeah. um, like uh, Latinois for example and, 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 and others like uh, there is a electro acoustic database on the Fondation Langlois also um, so there is no need for me to do this and it's a huge work but yeah, I made this list with artists, label, radio stations, venues, and so on from like, from Africa and Asia. Um, but because still nowadays, many people don't know that it, there is a lot happening in many countries outside of uh, the Western world. Uh, so it was important for me to make that visible and to share knowledge and also hope hopefully trigger more connections and collaborations uh, so I have this database I have a newsletter I organize concerts when I can yeah. I'm um, co-curator sometimes being invited at festival to um, make a selection I do radio shows as well that are for some focused on to Asia Africa Latin America Eastern Europe sometimes also at some point um because yeah still nowadays i often hear some people telling me oh i, I didn't know there were people doing this kind of music in tanzania or or in uh, algeria in yeah. in um, kurdistan i say why not there's they've got instruments schools universities culture computers internet access and even without internet access without computer there are people doing this experimental music also definitely, definitely. so uh, it's important for me to to show that the western world is not the center of the world mm. it has never been there is no center of the world basically <laughs> it's just a legend well and and speaking of compilations you know and 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 um you know, you did you did a compilation um, uh, for Beirut, um, and uh, and that that was uh, I mean that was remarkable. I mean, you 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 basically put that together like in a day, right? And 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 uh, I mean, I mean, I was honored to be included on that on that compilation. Um, you know, and it actually it actually led me uh, to uh, an interesting collaboration with this dancer, um, and and she discovered the music on the compilation, and then asked me if she could use it, you know, for her uh, avant-garde dance piece and 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 film, and um, and so like, you know, I think these compilations that you're doing they they have a lot of impact because I mean for me it served as a, a remarkable education because I learned about so many artists that I would have never, ever heard about and any other way, you know, and suddenly, you know, I found out about all about, you know, all about their practices. And, and I, I've even reached out to a couple of them to collaborate, the ones that really inspired me. And so thank you for doing this, because I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the philanthro philanthropic, you know, you donated the money that was raised to, to, you know, to this great cause. But then there's also the fact that it was kind of like a, like a, a really great way to document all these different people's practices, you know, and, and to share them in, in, in like, in such an accessible way, I guess. So what I'm saying is thank you, basically. No, thank you too. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear that you, it led you to make a collaboration. I, I did not uh, uh, see this. It's, it's good to know. <laughs> no, it, the compilations, I think are, are great too. I remember years ago, I had friends telling me, it was a decade ago, maybe telling me that, they had not any interest in, in buying compilations because they would tell me that they would prefer to, to buy an album, a full album of, a, of an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that this time has changed now. I, I see more and more people into playlists, into mixes and into compilations to try to access a maximum of 
different genres and, and um, artists as well. But also I think the compilations, they can trigger, like you said, uh, collaborations. So one artist might discover another one on the same CD and, uh, and write the person, hey, would you like to do something together? Or I didn't know that there was somebody in, in that city doing this. And so for me, it's very important. And of course, the Beirut compilation was very particular. It was for raising money because of um, this uh, unfortunate accident. And because I'm deeply connected to Beirut, because I have a band there, because I've been in the past nine or 10 years, uh, very often to, there to perform, to record music, to meet friends. And uh, um, so it was really a shock to me, especially knowing that the, the situation before the explosion was already pretty bad. It was really dim because of the war ne ne next door, be because of the, the economic crisis, the corruption, because of the current pandemic as well. And then this on, on top. So I thought, hey, uh, we need to do something. And my plan was to, to, to write, you know, on social networks and write some personal emails to a few friends thinking, okay, if I get like 10, 15 tracks, I'm happy and I publish it. But then it was a flood. <laughs> so many people wanted to contribute. And they are like 97 pieces within 24 hours. <laughs> I was so amazed that I thought, wow, people are so supportive. And I got pieces from all continents. I got pieces from Uganda, from Lebanon, from, from Belgium, from um, Mexico, from the USA, um, fr from Japan, as far as I remember also, yeah. Did and you get one from Antarctica? Pardon? Did you get one from Antarctica? No. <laughs> no scientist from one of those bases sent me anything, unfortunately. <laughs> they are missing. But no, I, 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 it was... Uh, I felt good to see how supportive the the scene or the scenes, the scenes that are interconnected into one big scene, global scene, yeah. were regarding this. And then there the, there were also other compilations, uh, more or less together at the same time, like um, Rabi Behani Behani uh, from Lebanon, who is also uh, owning a Morphine Records published a compilation as well. He's not the only one. There were other artists. I remember there were similar projects with um, uh, the tsunami in, uh, in Japan. There were a lot of people from the noise and experimental scene that organized uh, compilations to give money for, for, for these projects. Um, it, it's amazing. Yeah, there was really a lot of support. It's, yeah, I love it. <laughs> It's good to, to see uh, that it's, uh, many people tell me, yeah, experimental music is not political. I think it can be, but once you make a compilation, a track for a compilation, or you give a track for a compilation that is dedicated to help um, people for a particular cause, it is political at some point. It is. No, it really is. And I mean, even the people say that, look, I, I, I'm apolitical or, or, you know, I don't have a political stance, you know, um, even by saying that, I, somewhat ironically, that is a political statement. Saying that you don't make a political statement actually is a political statement. So, so when I, and when I point this out to some people, they're like, oh, but you know, that's just semantics or, you know, you're just, you're, you know, you're, it's like, it's, it's a verbal <laughs> jargon or something. And I say, but you know what, it, it's true. Just think about it, you know, like by not making a statement, that is a statement, you know, and, and maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's just my conceptual art mind, you know, having, having a field day, but, but I feel like it's, it's a valid point, you know, that, that, that no matter no matter what we do we can't escape the fact that we are in some way shape or form political you know somehow yeah sure you know um but art doesn't ha i mean the the purpose of art doesn't have to be political i, I mean that's a whole other genre of art right political art or 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 satire mm -hmm. or whatever you know stuff that's comment comment that's a commentary on the you know on social or or you know or political uh, causes um so tell me, tell me about uh, your use of uh, synthesizers and tape, because uh, I know you've done I know you've done some experiments with synthesizers and tape. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, 
back in the late 80s and early 90s, I didn't have so much money. I was a teenager and uh, I could not afford to, to, to buy back then a, a good recorder. And let's not start with a computer back then. It, 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 it was so expensive. Um, so I started to experiment with uh, cassette tapes. So I, was op I would open them and uh, slice the tape and do collage um play them reversed and so on yeah. uh, i just yeah it was a real experiment i wanted to experiment uh, then uh, later on i studied electroacoustic music many years later yeah. in uh, in belgium with annette van der Gorn. Um, she was my my professor mm -hmm. and it was one of the last years when uh, we had Still the opportunity to play with uh, with tapes. I'm not sure they still do it now. It, it switched a lot to computer music, um, Maxima Speed, and so on. Uh, there, there but then we were using. Uh... Pardon. I was just going to say there are, there are people that 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 make a point of recording onto tape. There are people who say that they don't want to have any computers in the process. So they'll, they'll record straight onto tape and then from the tape straight onto vinyl. I don't know. I mean, there, there's people, there's people that, are, that are doing this kind of stuff. It's not, it's, I mean, it, there's, still, there's, still an, there, there's still an underground scene or an underculture of, of musicians or artists who are, no, sure you, are. you know. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, like um, Brume, for example, in, in France, this artist is uh, almost exclusively working with tapes. I think only one of his albums has been made with, with, without tapes. But what I meant is back then at the conservatory, we still had access to um, reel to reel. So um, I experimented a tiny bit with symbols and um, and reel to reel. I never saved that uh, track. It's still on the reel to reel uh, somewhere. I, I'm, I'm even not sure I have it in Berlin. It might still be somewhere in Belgium. I should digitize it one day and see because I can't remember how it sounds <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, but we were working back then with um, Pro Tools that I, I, I disliked. I deeply disliked this this this. Uh, software and now i'm working with the uh, reaper which is to me uh, an amazing software uh, but uh, yeah these these are my little experiments with tapes i did then i i, I managed to buy a monophonic oh no I, I got it for free even a monophonic tape recorder so i used to include um these tape experiments into my electronic music so i had cheap synthesizers um then later on computers samplers drum machines uh, very the, the classics until one day i sold uh, most of my gears except the the effects the pedals and only used computers and uh, in the end I, I came back to uh hardware as well so now i'm, I'm using mostly the computer but also a lot of um, acoustic instruments and synthesizers uh, objects uh, pedals so I'm, I'm using everything right, right now because they all have their own uh, properties qualities advantages disadvantages and so on and i'm not somebody who is a pro tape pro analog synth pro modular pro this pro that pro computer i don't care i care about the sound and and the composition and if the composition pleases my ears yeah, be it. I don't care that the person used an analog synth or um, Jaws harp or a computer from 1973. It's, uh, I mean, if there is a concept behind it, it can be interesting, of course. But it's the sound that I like. So, um, yeah. But my experiments with synth, it's not, it's not so much. I had cheap synthesizers back then, so it was just... Uh, processing them through um, pedals, like uh, guitar pedals, so in distortion and delays and stuff like this. And uh, it's been only a few years that I started to, to buy synth again, not so many. And I got the opportunity to go to um, Stockholm to do a 
10 days residency at the EMS. So I stayed 10 nights for sure and parts of the days uh, in the studios to play mostly with the, a surge synthesizer that I find amazing. It's a, a very old modular synth. Um, there was a book lab there as well, but much more complicated and I'm not so used to um, this uh, patching technology, analog technology. So I wanted to work with so something a bit more simple mm -hmm. uh, and not lose time to, to learn how to properly patch the book lab while the search is much easier to me. And, uh, and I just, yeah, I experimented a lot to see what, what I could get from that synth. And I still have to make some compositions with, uh, with it. I'm finishing some, uh, but everything ends up onto my computer and then I'm mixing and treating everything. Nothing very special, in fact. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I like using acoustic and electronic, you know, things together. Like, for example, I did, a, I did an experimental um, uh, sort of album, which was based on, on feedback that could be generated from putting uh, microphones uh, next to the tabla, you know, the Indian drums. So I, I, I used the tabla, I made a tone, and then I put the microphone and then I would generate certain tones of feedback. So, you know, at, at the end, you know, it, it, it sounded nothing like a tabla. And so when I told people, like I, in the linear notes, you know, I wrote that the main instrument was tabla, nobody believed me. So then I had to actually, I, I recorded a video of myself actually doing that process, you know, and, and you know, and people were like, holy shit, like that, that's so unusual. Like we've never, like we didn't even know that was possible. I said, I didn't know it was possible. It happened by accident. You know, I was putting a microphone on and I played something and it started feeding back. And I realized if I play a certain sound then the feedback is, you know, it, it's a certain note or it's a certain frequency. So, so then I, I, I thought, why don't I make this a, you know, a, a composition? And once I made one composition, then I, mm. I said, you know, you got bit by the bug and suddenly like I, I'd done like 15 compositions and I had an album's worth of material. And, and, um, and so it's, it's really interesting that like some, uh, some of the more interesting things actually happen just completely by mistake or totally unintentionally. It's like, you know, and, and you just, you just happen to be there and notice that it's interesting and you capitalize on that, uh, you know, on that phenomenon that, that, you know, that, you know, that just happened while you, you happen to, you know, be playing in the space. So I, I like, I like when things like that, sure. I like when things like that happen, because I think that, that, that changes the role of the composer. It makes you more of an observer or like more of a, like mm. more, yeah, more of a participant than being in control, you know, which I think is interesting. Yes, yeah, of course, uh, the, this is the thing with improvised music, basically. You are somehow trying to keep things under control, but you cannot fully keep things under control. Accidents always happen. And I think it's a huge difference between um, Western classical music and classical music from other parts of the world. Hello, hello, back, yeah. yeah? Yeah, you're back. Okay, yeah, okay, we were. So, the last, the last so yeah, I, 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 I think it's a, it's a difference between classical music from the West and classical music from uh, non-Western countries, or many of them, is that accidents can be part of classical music from other places, like Indonesia, for example, because it's not played in a, entirely insulated, isolated environment, like a concert hall, which is studied, perfectly built to have no sounds from the outside world, to have a perfect acoustic and so on and so forth. While you would have maybe a gamelan orchestra, for example, uh, performing outdoor, you will have accidents, you have insects, you will have birds or scooters, whatever. Um, so even though it's somehow under control, it's classical music, uh, this gamelan orchestra, but it's not entirely under control like it can be in the West. 
I think it's interesting. I'm not, again, I'm not pro one, pro the other one. I, I don't care. I like both. It's fine to me anyway. So, so you're an eclecticist, basically. You know, you're interested in all these different... So, some, somehow, yeah, yeah. I can be a bit uh, rigid regarding a few things in my life. I know these people tell me. But for other things, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm really open-minded and uh, ready to, to try to understand and discover more uh, as much as I can, basically. Right. Well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, like, for example, you, you know, your definition of of uh, what what it means to be experimental music like like if somebody posts i don't know something that's mainstream techno on 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 you know on the on the facebook group for example on surf that that that's not that's not what the group is for right like that you wouldn't that wouldn't like that you would you would sort of say no okay look you know this is not this is not meant for the group you know yeah, yeah. If it's very, very classic techno, most likely I, I would say no. It's also for me. It's not only a matter of taste. It's also that if we start with this, it's a never-ending story. There are so many people doing techno. Uh, if everybody starts to be posting techno music, techno tracks, all the rest will be um, put aside. You know, it's going to be completely flooded with more mainstream techno, for example. Or, it's also why I restrict the group. Also, I don't include most most um, rock music or punk music. There are exceptions sometimes, but because the scenes there are so big, I, I don't want them to obscure uh, the rest. And there are other groups anyway. On there are so many groups on Facebook where you can post any anyway, your your techno or whatever else that it's not needed. I think it's one of the the issues with internet nowadays. Yeah, there is too much of everything, which is good and, and very bad at the same time. Because everything can become lost very, very easily, you know? And trends go go away very fast. Like, oh yeah, there is this music from yeah, I remember there was a time there was a tiny trend. It was um a music from South Africa, uh Shanghai and Electro Electro. Uh, which comes from the Sh Shangan uh, music from the, the north of South Africa, close to Botswana, from the townships of uh, Johannesburg. It has been a tiny bit trendy. Um, Honest John's record published a compilation uh, in the UK. So people in Europe started to know a bit about it. And six months later, one year later, Maximus was gone. Who's that next? Now it's uh, the calm music a tiny bit, maybe Singeli, I'm not sure. Electro Cumbia also is a bit popular, but it's always very quick, you know, and then you are flooded with things and, and the rest doesn't exist anymore, then it disappears. Uh, I find it pretty sad, you know. Also the fact that somebody publishes a track or an album and six months later, people tell you, oh yeah, it's old. When I was a kid, old man, like this track was composed 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> no, not like six months ago. Right, so <laughs> there's kind of a compression of the, of the time frame, like because we live in this hyper accelerated society, the time, the time frames are so much, they're so much shorter, you know, um, you're right. And, and, but I mean, then there's also, yeah, the yeah, thing, yeah, like, the, what... oh, go ahead. Sorry, like what you said earlier with, with the, the attention spam, mm -hmm. like people have a hard time to concentrate more than five minutes, you know, it's the same. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, and like, have you, have you done any um, uh, experiments with symbols where, I don't know, like you, you hand hammer them or, you know, you stack them or you do like, you, you modify them in some way to you know, uh, to get the sound that you have in your head? Hmm. So far, no. I use a lot of symbols, especially with a project with uh, Marie Takahashi. We have a duo uh, where she plays uh, the viola and I play gongs, symbols, and some other percussions, metal objects, whatever. But I never modified any of the, um, the symbols uh, because I like the way they sound and I would be afraid to lose the sound they they do now so i use them in a very classic way we, I, I bow them or i play with different sticks my hands sometimes with nothing very 
super special. Um, no, but, but I, I tend to collect um, metal junk from, from the streets, whatever I find, a plate, a, a pipe, anything. And in that case, I may dare to modify the, the object if I think, okay, it doesn't sound so good. Maybe I could try to make it sound better. Right. Um, maybe because I did not spend any money in, uh, <laughs> right, right. in collecting them. Uh, well, what it seemed was I paid them. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I totally understand. Actually, I, uh, I've i been hand hammering my own symbols for quite a while now, um, you know, for almost four years. And uh, when I first started out, you know, hand hammering my own symbols, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I, I, I'd never studied it. I'd never, you know, nobody ever told me, you know, how to do it or what the correct technique was or anything. So it was just, I just one day I took a hammer, I started, you know, hand, hand hammering the symbol and I liked how how it turned out. I liked how it sounded, you know. So so then, uh, so then it just yeah, it just became a thing. And now now I've done all kinds of stuff. I've 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 intentionally rusted cymbals, like where I cover them in salt water and then I let them rust, to you know to modify the sound. I've tried burying them in the ground. I've tried you know uh, like using blowtorch uh, to you know to you know, and yeah, I've done all kinds of weird experiments. And so in that way, I I, I sort of think of myself as like a you know, a metal worker or a sculptor of some sort, you know, but, but like, but, but it's kind of, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's not really a sculpture. It's just a symbol, but, you know, but it's like the same techniques, uh, uh, you know, you would use to, you know, to hammer a sheet of bronze or, you know, or, you know, or to modify, I don't know, copper or something. So, and right now I've been collecting Tibetan singing bowls. I actually have, I have some here behind me and, uh, yeah. So these are they're, they're hand hammered, you see, um, and and so yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious about you know. Um, I'm curious about uh, about trying to make some myself, like you know where where I would you know take scrap scrap metal uh, and sort of make my own bowls out of that and hand hammer them and and so like you like you're doing with these found objects or you know with this. Uh, the, the, this these metal objects. I'm also thinking of doing something with like with found objects with scrap metal and then heating it up, melting it down, and casting it into into these uh, instruments. So, mm. so yeah, I, I I have a feeling like the this idea of using found objects is is quite uh, quite interesting. And and I know what you mean when you say like you know like like you paid for the symbol so you don't want to you don't I mean if you damage it then you know you're out of pocket but like you know if if it's just a, a pipe that you found on the street and you know you change it in some way and it, and it goes badly well then it's like fine I mean I didn't pay anything for it so it doesn't matter <laughs> so yeah. yeah sure of course yeah yeah <laughs> uh, have you ever used ebos you know what ebos are right the the little um... you know sure. Yeah, yeah, it's funny you 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 ask me this because uh, my next solo album contains a lot of ebo, <laughs> when ebo instruments. So I'm I'm I used it uh, on several um, violins, mm. uh, also the Western classical violin, but also a hu, the Chinese violin. Mm -hmm. uh, I used also that on the cello, but on the cello is very difficult because of the the strings. You know, it's, it it works on one string basically. I used that that on the zither also uh, quite a lot, and I use it live sometimes. Uh, but uh, most of the time, I treat them then on my computer, like pitching and uh, processing the things. So this album contains a few pieces made of partly or exclusively uh, e-boat instruments. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a process I find very interesting. The result is a, what well, sounds like an organ or a synthesizer sometimes on, on some, like on the zither. It's, it's amazing how it sounds. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, sure, of course, I, I like to use that. <laughs> uh, and speaking of organs and uh, particularly um, pipe organs, uh, you know, have you have you used have you used them uh, in your in your compositions at all? Have you have you experimented with uh, with the wind instruments or like with aerophones and things like that? 
uh, not with organs. I know you do, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I never did. Unfortunately, I I, I can't play the I, I, the piano or whatever. I, I mean, I, I should learn some basics, but I I, I can't. <laughs> I'm really uh, awful. Uh, and the the only wind instruments I used were a uh, ken instrument. So a uh, ken is an instrument from. Uh, Northern Thailand, Laos, uh, Vietnam, a bit China. They have different shapes. I have a, China, um, a Vietnamese and a Lao one. Um, it's been a while I haven't used them, unfortunately, because they are not, uh, I don't have them at home r right, right now. Um, I need to bring them back one day or another. I, I cannot really play properly the Ken. It's not that easy to, to learn. I should take time to learn. But I use them for um, some compositions and to create sounds as well as other wind instruments uh, in the past. Have you, um, have you ever... Have instruments you ever, that I buy when I travel. Right, because like you collect instruments. Wherever you go, you know, you might pick up a, a, an instrument, you know. As much as possible, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you really, wanted to ask something. Yeah, well, there's two questions. So I'll ask you the one that came to my mind first, which is, um, have you used an ocarina? Like, you know, the, the, the ceramic instrument? Uh, ever have you ever tried uh, using that in 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 your uh, compositions or or trying to play them yourself? No, I, I never did. Never had one in my hands. <laughs> well, I've I've I mean uh, my I, my first girlfriend uh, collected them. She had a whole collection of ocarinas and in different keys and stuff. And um, yeah, they they have a very they have a very pure sound, almost like a pure sine wave, actually. They they have a, a very distinct sound. It's it's almost characterless, if you ask me. Like it, it like you know you it's it's weird. Um, but uh, the other question I wanted to ask you is about you know archiving. So in in a way you're almost like a librarian, but with sounds. You know, like some people collect l rare books and manuscripts, mm. and I have a feeling like what you do is you correct collect rare sounds. So like you're you're like a librarian or an archivist of sound. Somehow, I, I guess, and I must say, I I record a lot of sounds that I, in the end, never use. I might use them one day, but uh, they must fit the composition I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not somebody who works systematically with a very precise idea in mind and a kind of sound and so on. I do sometimes, but most of the time it's kind of random, mm -hmm. like it or not. Um, and I'm also, yeah, somehow collecting a lot of music that that's the true fact i buy a lot of music from asia africa mostly but from everywhere in general and uh, i'm a bit obsessed with this and i have my own archive of uh, this so-called contemporary electronic experimental music from africa and asia i try to, to to buy as much as i can for for the radio shows for my for, for myself as well because it's just important. <laughs> I don't see myself as a collector. Some friends tell me I'm a collector at some point. I don't buy blindly things like some collectors would do. I'm not also ready to put a hundred bucks to buy a record. I would never do that. I, I, I can't anyway. But that's true that I buy a lot. That's and and uh, it's also for sharing. It's uh, I'm I'm happy to listen at home, but I share it through the radio shows, through DJ sets, or when my friends come over. But also with the sounds, I share some. There are some I put on um, um, Free Sound, this uh, website, where you can upload and download music for free. And so some of the field recordings I do, or some instruments I, I use sometimes, like gongs, I record, I make some good quality recordings to, to share with people. I mean, not everybody can have a gong, not everybody can go and record a river or, or the sea. So I'm happy to share that when I have time and put that online. I don't do it often enough, I must say, uh, due, due to a lack of time, but uh, each time I can, I do it, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's in, in a way, it's kind of like a, pro a public service or, or like, or sort of your own little way of, of sharing your your sound world with people. Yeah, somehow. I used to work in a media library in, in, in Belgium um, in the 1990s until the early 2000s, something like this. Um, 
So uh, media library where we, we had mostly music and, and films, also language courses and video games. But the main focus was films, documentaries and fictions and uh, music, all kinds of music, all kind, kinds of films. Meaning we had everything from the most mainstream pop music to uh, the most obscure harsh noise, um, death metal, um, free jazz, blues, and uh, traditional music from everywhere, from remote islands anywhere, from, you could find everything. everything. You could find traditional music from Belgium, traditional music from the Salomon Islands or from Taiwan and so on and so forth. So I had already, I was already deep into uh, collecting <laughs> there and sharing, of course, and archiving. So uh, yeah, it was a, a very nice exp um, e uh, experience in fine back then. Yeah. And uh, and do you do you enjoy uh, the the sound of throat singing at all, or or overtone sing singing, or or, or multiphonic singing? I do, especially uh, from Tuva, Mongolia, uh, more than the uh, Inuit, which is very nice, but uh, it touches me less than uh, the Tuvan Mongolian throat singing to me is really impressive. Yeah. And uh, back then when I worked in this media library, I remember that my boss invited um, Hun Urtu, this band from Tuva, to perform. It was a very impressive concert. And I dream, still dream to see um, Yatha live. It's a band also from Tuva that I find amazing, really uh, <laughs> excellent band. It, it's not traditional music, what they do. I mean, it's inspired, of course, um, but it's a kind of Tuvan blues, something like this. It's a very impressive music, yeah. Do you enjoy this kind of uh, throat singing? Very, very much. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And you know, I've, I, what I actually want to record like uh, an orchestra of, of like, I want to, I want to make a composition for, for throat singing, uh, and use contact microphones and like uh, and piezo microphones against mm. people's throats to, to actually capture the sound. Um, you know, and um, and and uh, you know, I want to do this in some sort of cave. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the 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 organ that's that's inside a cave. It's like a stactylite organ where the the there's ha rubber hammers that hit the stactylites, which are these you know you know what they are right? They're these these formations inside the cave. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll send you a link to it so you can check out what it sounds like. It's otherworldly. Okay. And I want to record like a throat a throat singing orchestra in that cave, and I want all the people to be in different places around this massive cave. And, and cave system and all sing together with me on the organ playing the the the, the statle mites and uh, and record that mm. and um, well I think that I think that that would be a sound that nobody's ever heard before like it, it, it would be it, it, like that that combination of sound as well in that particular acoustic I mean I think it would be well I think it would be really interesting so so you know um, so yeah, to, to 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 basically, I am hugely inspired by throat singing, and and I I, I even there's even All like right. the, the Tibetan monks who do like a certain kind of throat singing where they have yeah. like a, a growl, they have a growl in their voice, and I I find that really that really quite beautiful. It, it's almost like like in metal, you know, when they when they do the growl, uh, but like <laughs> but but obviously with with this kind of singing, it's it's more controlled and more like sustained than than you know, I don't know, but. Yeah, I, to, could I, be I, the. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the technique is a bit similar, and indeed in Tibet you have this. You have Yan Jun, this um, composer from uh, China, from Beijing, is also uh, using throat singing, this kind of Tibetan technique, mm. in some of his compositions. Sometimes with with the, his poetry, with his uh, feedback and so on. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, do you do you use any electronic uh, percussion? Like, do you ever use a sampling pad um, or like, uh, or like, you know, um, what are they called? Um, 
the the Ableton the the with all the little squares on it the um, the push controller I think is what it's called something like oh uh, yeah no uh, well basically I used during a short time of my life what was called an octopad or octopad I don't really remember yes, it was yes, in the nineteen ninety yes yes so uh, the instrument <laughs> yeah exactly the, the instrument behind me this one it's kind of uh, kind yeah of similar. Yeah, 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 I see. Yeah, so uh, I, in this band I had, I still have Axiom. Um, so I, it's my oldest still active duo. We started around 1990. And back then I was in the early 1990s uh, playing. I played some tracks with um, this uh, Octopad. Uh, my friend Olivier was using a sampler and we were recording on tape with voices as well. But it's the only time of my life I used electronic percussions. I never did uh, anymore. So maybe one day again, I, I don't know, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you know, um, I have this keyboard here which, uh, which only uses floppy disks. And so I have a, I have a huge collection of, of floppy disks. You know, I call it, I call it my floppy disk orchestra. You know, and um, and it's it's quite interesting because having the limitation of only having five megabytes to record on, it really forces you to sort of figure out what's essential. You know, because like on a computer, you basically have an unlimited amount of space. Not really, but you know what I mean. Like you can, you know, you can basically just spend hours and hours just, you know, all this stuff and just and and suddenly, you know, you realize if 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 I really had to cut this down to to the essence of what it is. And what would remain, and and so I think working with limitations is sometimes um, like uh, a good thing, and and it it'll inspire you to to be creative in ways that maybe if you had unlimited options that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be forced to work uh, in that in that particular way. I don't know if you if you've ever put limitations on yourself to like whether whether it's saying mm -hmm. you know this sound doesn't go here or. I don't know, like, I don't know. So I'm asking basically like as a producer, cause like, you know, what, what, like, 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 do you, do you impose limitations on yourself or on other people when you're, when you're working with them? On other people, no, I, I never do. On myself, rarely, it happens. I remember when I studied electroacoustic music, we had to make a composition with, uh, I think it was one second recording. And you had to make a composition with this one second recording, like extend it at some point, which is very interesting. It forces you to think a lot <laughs> about which technique and uh, how to build it without turning it into something just plain boring. Um, sometimes I do, like for my new album, I know that there is one track, I thought okay, I only use this, um, search synthesizer and I process with a computer but no other sounds uh with another one it's eboard a who and almost nothing else I, I thought I want one instrument one sound source and maybe a, a second one perhaps but that's it so I occasionally do it but it's not an a major characteristic of uh, of, of my work because I usually use the computer, even though I, I I use a lot of acoustic sounds taken straight uh, with a microphone or with a um, portable recorder. But usually I just, yeah, it's just my feeling. I think, okay, this sound looks good with, sounds good with this one, or perhaps I could use this archive as well. Maybe I could add this, that, and that. And, I'm, I'm building a lot of things, uh, but sometimes, yeah, when we don't limit ourselves, we can get lost. This is a true fact as well. <laughs> and uh, have you used theremin at all in any of your recordings? No, I touched a theremin. I mean, not touch. I approached <laughs> theremin uh, a long time ago. A friend had one. Uh, I remember in Singapore and uh, 
I thought, oh gosh, it's so difficult to play. Apart of doing noise, I can't do anything with this. <laughs> I should really learn to play it properly. I mean, fair enough, it's nice to play noise, but I would like to 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 be able to control it. But I, I never, I never bought one. So I thought, okay, if I don't buy one, I, I'm not going to lose time to to learn how to to play it. I, if I would buy one, I would force myself, of course, to 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 learn how to play it properly, yeah. Yes. While in classically, not properly, but yes. in a classical way. Definitely, definitely. Um, and and I, wanted to, I wanted to bring up your work as a curator. So, you know, you told me that sometimes you're invited to festivals and, you know, you, you make selections of, of, you know, artists and, you know, you, you, you yeah. So, so as a curator, what are you looking for? Like, what, what's, what are your, what's your criteria? Like, what, what do you, like, is it just what's interesting to you? Is it like what, or do you, do you work with the criteria that the festival says, you know, we want this kind of artist and then you'll provide that kind of artist? Or how does it work is what I'm asking, like your, your, your role as a curator? Mm. Well, it's for a festival, for a few times it happened, except one time. Uh, one time I was free to invite whoever I wanted. It's a long time ago in Belgium. Um, but more recently, it's just a, a festival that focuses on something specific, very specific topic. Uh, like um, in Sweden for either next year or 2022, it's still unclear because of the current um, well, pandemic. Yes. Um, Geiger Festival asked me um, to, to, to make a list of artists we could invite. And it's regarding uh, this uh, African compilation I published earlier this year. So the topic of the festival, or part, partly the topic of the festival is uh, presenting artists of African descent or from Africa who do uh, electroacoustic music, uh, improvised music and so on. So in that case, um, um, I have a, my my frame is pretty narrow, basically, which is fine to me. I have no problem with this. On the other hand, um, when I organize myself concerts, then I'm free. But often, I have a few rules. It's um, having more or less an equal amount of um, um, men and women, or transgender people, if they are transgender people who who are around and, and in, interesting regarding the music they do. And I try to invite as many non-Western artists as I can. That's not an absolute rule. It's not always possible. And also I don't have a lot of budgets. You know, it's, Berlin is not always easy. Um, but if uh, I do it alone, Berlin is a multinational uh, city. So it's never impossible to have artists from, one artist from Cameroon, one from Taiwan, one from uh, Serbia and so on. Uh, to me, it's very important to not just again focus on two artists from Germany and France and uh, the USA. It's uh, just a, a bit pointless for me. Of course, I, I, I look at the quality. I don't want to invite an artist from uh, Iran or, or, or from Taiwan just for the sake of inviting somebody from there even though the quality is not there. I would not invite a, a woman whose music uh, is not interesting to me neither. Um, so this is also important for me. Then I've been invited to uh, a bit co-curate some other festivals where I could invite one or two other artists, um, like the Micro Music Festival here in Berlin. I think it was two years ago where we booked uh, Dimitri de la Faye, with whom I wrote the book uh, Not Your World Music, as well as um, two composers from um, uh, Vietnam and Thailand, indeed, yeah. Um, so there was also a, a specific topic there. It was uh, around this work, this research we did in, in uh, and about Southeast Asia. Uh, but I was free to invite whoever I, I wanted. Of course, it was a, a selection after me, but uh, 
it was fitting, so it went well. So this this is high work. It's not total freedom, uh, but it's good like this. Uh, I, I don't mind. It, but I'm I'm not a, a professional curator. You know, it's just uh, I mean what people call curator. I organize my own concerts. Um, sometimes on a regular basis, depending on if I'm on tour or not. And uh, once, twice, thrice per year, I'm invited by other organizations or festivals to advise or or co-curate uh, one event inside the festival, for example. And uh, you're also, uh, this is on a totally different topic, uh, you're also a vegan. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, like when when did you decide that you wanted to be a vegan and uh, and why what what's what's the reason for for that choice? <laughs> uh, almost nineteen years ago, and next year will be nineteen years ago. I became a vegan. I was a vegetarian for several years before. Well, my main reason is uh, animal rights. The way we humans treat animals is wrong, completely wrong. I understand people who live in the steppes and hunt or maybe raise a few animals like a yak and, and kill this animal, this big animal sometimes. They kill one and share with the community and so on. I understand because there's not so much else to, to eat there and their societies can be very different than the the rest of the global world we live in. It's not only about the Western world; it's everywhere. Right. But in urban environments, in, in and and so on, I think we all know that animals are mistreated. They are raised in horrible conditions most of the time. Anyway, they are raised to be killed, which is awful. They are treated like a capital, like like some goods not like a living being that deserves to not suffer and not be killed. And uh, I dislike that a lot. So that is why I, I, I'm a vegan. Of course, there are other impacts, like you can think about uh, um, ecology and being greener, but with this, it's not always sure. You, you, I know vegans who are not green at all. It depends on what kind of vegan diet you have. If you only eat things wrapped under plastic and that travel 10,000 kilometers, like eating, you live in Germany, you eat avocados every day. That doesn't make any sense to me, you know? Um, um, but yeah, globally, it's this, this respect towards animals and also towards anyway, the environment and, uh, the earth and, and people as well. I mean, I'm sure that not everybody who works in, in a slaughterhouse is, is happy of doing this job. It, I mean, there are certainly people who enjoy it for sure, but I'm sure not everybody. I read interviews of people who told that they did it to get a job, but they hated it. Or they had nightmares, for example. Um, and uh, the environmental impact of, uh, the cattle industry, for example, is a real disaster. It is. Uh, wherever you are, whether it is in China or in Canada or, or here in, in, in Europe, it's the same. And the way those animals are being fed as well, and this food ending up in people's stomachs and bodies and the waste in the rivers and so on, the excess of copper, of pesticides, all this is wrong to me, completely wrong. Of course, it's not only a problem inherent to the uh, animal exploitation is the way we, we grow plants as well and we exploit the soil and so on, which is on an average completely wrong. But it's also difficult to solve that issue, I think, because who wants to work in a farm and plant um, her or his or their vegetables and fruits and collect them? It's a hard job. It's not easy. And there are less and less farmers, and everything is being taken over by big conglomerates. That is an issue, and it's a bit out of thought as well, I think. I like to garden, and I do as much as I can, for sure. 
but I don't live uh, at the countryside and maybe I would never live at the countryside, I don't know. So it's, it's not always easy. So I, I depend also on this uh, large scale uh, agriculture, uh, agronomy and so on. So uh, I think we are a tiny bit respons all responsible of, of, of this <laughs> at some point, but the way animals are treated is possible to solve this if if we all stop to eat it's not never going to happen i'm, I'm not uh, uh i don't believe in this uh, utopia you know <laughs> i don't dream about it i don't think it's ever going to happen i hope i'm wrong i mean some people expect to grow meat in lab now fair enough if they want to do it i would not touch this whatever this meat would be but uh, if some people are okay with it and uh, if it's sustainable, if it's not dangerous, if if it's ethical, like, if people work also to produce this are treated properly also, is another issue, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, go on, sorry. Th there's like, like there's a, there's a movement where uh, people are, are, are making leather out of, out of plants or something. Uh, so, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's more ethical than, you know, than, leather from you know from an animal you know no, of course you can make so so-called uh, fake leather mock leather of a uh, pineapple for example or uh, hemp uh, also uh, and and other other um, fabric made of not only cotton which is also a, a badly polluting industry but uh, metals for example can be used um yeah sure there, there are options and uh, well, who knows? Maybe it's going to change in a good way. I I, I see that the, the awareness of uh, animal mistreatment and human mistreatment is is there more and more. You you see vegan collectives and, and movements in many places. Not only many people think it's a Western fad, but it's not. It's not at all. Veganism exists in China for thousands of years. Uh, also out of respect for the animals through Buddhism, of course. Um, and you have uh, um, more and more, um, yeah, Jain people, for example, in India, also uh, respecting animals, eating vegan and so on. The Bishnoi communities, uh, it's also another religion in India. They are not vegan, they, they, they consume uh, milk, but have an, an, an incredible respect of the, the animals and then they never kill them. They, they don't mistreat them and they respect trees as well, which is uh, amazing. And uh, you see it everywhere. You, you can meet vegan people in Egypt, vegan people in, uh, in Iran, vegan people in, in China. It's not only the West and uh, for some it's only religious, but for more and more it's this awareness that we, we are destroying the earth. We, we, mistreat animals and also humans nevertheless and we need to change this and uh, i think it's great that it's happening everywhere but again i understand that it's not everybody's priority some people live in 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 such emergency sometimes you know if you have uh, no money no job no roof whatever your priority is of course not animal rights. I mean, for some it is, and fair enough, it's amazing, but it's not possible uh, for, for everyone. Uh, of course, if every day you think, what, what shall I eat tomorrow? What shall I do to, 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 to feed my family? It, it depends on the context, of course, but here for me in Berlin, or even when I travel, it's, it's easy to be a vegan. It's, pretty easy game so uh, I think it's important for me to, to stay one I will anyway it's not going to change um, are you familiar with the with bells and particularly like the carillon you know like a collection of bells uh, like in a church mm. tower or like you know in a, in a public monument or something um, uh, have have you uh, have you used bells at all in in any of your compositions? I mean, because they are a percussion instrument when you think about it. 
Mm, yeah, of course. No, I use small bells, very small bells that I bought here and there, but nothing like uh, classical music bells or church bells. I attended some concerts, Gary Leon, for example, a concert played by uh, Charlemagne Palestine um, many years ago. Um, and I love the sound of, uh, of bells, I mean, the church bells. I, I find this is deep, this is amazing. I, I wish I could once do a composition with um, um, nicely sized bells, <laughs> uh, electroacoustic or classical or whatever else, doesn't matter. I wish, but I never applied to, to get this opportunity, but I, I love, because after all, yeah, it's a percussion and it's made of metal <laughs> yes. and the resonance can be brilliant for sure, yeah. Well, and it's it's one of those instruments where the 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 whole the open air the you know all the space around the instrument is the is the instrument like you know in uh, with the pipe organ the room that it's in or the the acoustic that it's in is also the instrument. Well, uh, with the bell you know that's in a tower, it's like all the surrounding area because you can hear it for five to ten miles you know around the church or around the the tower or whatever. So in in that way, it's a very public instrument, very very public. And you and the audience doesn't really have a choice in the matter. It's not like you can say, "Oh, I don't want to listen to this," or "I don't want to hear this," because it's there anyway. You know. So in that sense, it's it's one of the most public instruments that there is. It is. It is a bit problematic. I think that it is imposed like this. I, I mean, I love the sound, but not everybody likes it. So I, I think it should not be public. But fair enough. It is like this. It's a very old history. So. <laughs> be it for now at least <laughs> well hey i i want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this and and uh you know i i i really enjoyed this uh this uh dialogue and and uh I, i'll let you know as soon as it's uploaded i'll send you the link and uh and you know um one of these days, if if I'm in Berlin, definitely we should, you know, meet up in person, have a coffee, whatever, you know, it'll be, it'll be a, a pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot for also for the interview and uh, for what you do. Uh, for sure, if you come to Berlin, just tell me, even though right now it's a bit complicated, not impossible, but it's complicated. But uh, if you have the opportunity, sure. I'd, I haven't been to Canada in many, many years. I'm not really pushy to go to North America. I must say I'm not... A huge fan of North America, especially the USA. I prefer Canada, but still. <laughs> uh, but if I have the opportunity to go again there, who knows? It's not impossible. I would also tell you anyway. Um, but well, and, and you not know in what? a near would, future, I'm afraid. Um, it would be really Pardon? nice. It would, you know, I would I would love to you know to present you in Canada, you know, in a number of places. I mean, it would be really cool to you know. Uh, like to have you perform at the Aga Khan Museum, you know, in the distillery district, there's these beautiful old warehouses, um, you know, and like, you know, at, at some art galleries or, you know, at the Royal Ontario Museum or whatever. Um, so, you know, if if you do want to come to Canada, please let me know, because I, I would love to, you know, I, I'd love to, you know, share your music in Canada, because I think it's really interesting. Well, thank, thank you a lot. I mean, if it happens... Uh... One day, uh, I, I will tell you for, for sure. Uh, but I, right now, I can't because my priorities are not there. And especially now with the crisis, it's the only place where I, I, I travel right now is, is London um, because my girlfriend lives there. But th that's it. It's just uh, it's too complicated. And we can't play anyway. So it's a bit... Uh, yeah. It's weird, but so it is. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> what can we do? Just wait and see. How it's going to to be in a few months, years? I don't know how long it's going to last. It's a yeah. bit crazy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, I I have one last question that I completely forgot to ask, which is: Have you participated in any virtual music making sessions, like over Zoom or you know over uh, I don't know any other platform? Have you have you done any any virtual music uh, sessions? Mm, not not per se. I. I uploaded uh, one, two mixes, so-called DJ sets, for a Tusk Festival in the UK recently, uh -huh. and for another festival in uh, Berlin that was on-site and online. Um, 
and uh, Melody Melak and I, so a friend here in Berlin, um, did a few five sessions of uh, interviews and small concerts of artists from uh, Kurdistan, Nigeria, Iran, and the Philippines. Mm. But I did not play by myself. I was just interviewing them, and they would play, answer the questions. Um, no, I didn't because I, I didn't have so much time. I'm a bit, a bit busy at the moment, and. For the few I saw, I thought, mm, yeah, okay, but most people don't don't care. I realized that many of my friends they they watch five minutes again, this attention span, <laughs> and then they, they they are checking their phone and they don't really focus on to the concert anymore and so on and so forth. I thought, I oh, man, it's it's pointless. Um, nevertheless, I accepted to do one in January. Um, uh, I mix a DJ set live, it's going to be on YouTube here in Berlin. Uh, so I will not DJ anything um, beat oriented or very little if I do. It's going to be more whatever. I I'm going to do a collage of uh, few recordings, uh, probably free jazz, electroacoustic music, noise, industrial, uh, whatever um, from my own collection. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's one of the very few things I will have done, I think, during, during this uh, lockdown. I don't want it to be the future. I mean, it's interesting that everyone can access you live, or almost everyone, many people, from wherever on the planet. But then when you realize that so few people are really interested, and so many people did it, that again, it's a saturation. It's yes. uh, too much, too much. Uh, even if I wanted to, to watch all my friends who played, I, I, I couldn't. It's, I've seen a few, but I thought, I mean, I don't have time. I can't spend 10 hours per day to watch everybody playing all the festivals and so on. It's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> I wish I could, but it's, that's, that's not possible. Yeah. So I, I gave up. I thought, yeah. Yeah. All right, back. Shit. <laughs> It's cutting again. Okay. All right. It's probably my connection. And the connection here in Berlin is pretty bad, in fact. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, but anyway. Well, you know, and, and I just thought of one more question that, that I, I didn't get to ask. Mm -hmm. It's about the, it's about your experiments with your name, like where you, you do, you do uh, Cedric and then, and then you go through the whole alphabet with like, what's that all about? Uh, it's just a private joke. It's uh, it's uh, I published a track with a friend a long time ago on a compilation, and they made they made a mistake on the cover. It, it was written D Drake D dash Drake and not C dash Drake. Um, and I thought, <laughs> how is that possible? <laughs> but it was too late, you know. I had the CD in my hands. So I thought, wow. And then a friend told me, yeah, but why don't you use uh, this trick, man, why don't you do it on purpose now? And so I started to publish tracks only for compilations under the name of uh, yeah, J Drake and uh, O Drake and M Drake. And then I got lost and I realized I used twice the same letter and I gave up. I thought, okay, it's, it's, fu it's funny, but uh, <laughs> nothing very important. And, and I stopped doing it. <laughs> no deep concept. That's very funny. Well, there you go. So it's an inside joke is what it is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, take care and, uh, and, uh, and uh, looking forward to connecting again sometime in the future. Sure, sure. Take care. Thanks a lot for everything and uh, for what you do as well. And uh, yeah, speak soon anyway. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.